And, you know, we've been with Truecaller since 2012, uh, when we invested, saw them actually the first time, I think, in 2011. And, and then it was no business. Well, there was actually a little bit of business, but not, not the same kind of business you do nowadays. And, and um, one to two million users that were starting to grow really fast. And we invested in this vision of a smarter, better, trusted phone book and community of users uh, actually contributing to that global phone book. So there was a huge database at, at the heart, which today is a huger database. But, but uh, you know, the company exploded in user growth, uh, later went into payments and financial services. We definitely didn't see, see any of, of uh, uh, that, that coming. It's obviously raised money from some of the world's finest uh, investors and so on. So it's been quite a journey. And today what we really want to do is discuss around mainly the leadership and how does an entrepreneur prepare for a crazy journey where you, by definition, cannot predict, if any, not much of what's going to happen. And you always need to take you to the next step. Um, let's start with, with the facts, though. I mean, you know, 2012 we came in, but where are you today when it comes to users and revenues and growth and organization and, and so on? Yeah, uh, thank you, Tom. And thanks for being with us for the last eight years. Um, we are today around 220 people in five different locations, uh, but the main ones are in Stockholm and Bangalore. And um, we... Uh, just recently crossed 200 million active users on our product uh, and uh, uh, started focus on revenues three years back. And uh, our main revenue tracks are advertisement and subscription uh, for end consumers. And today, subscription stands for around 30% of our revenues, but it continues to grow. Uh, we uh, uh, crossed 1.3 million subscribers by the end of the year. But doesn't sound a lot, but we, we launched a subscription product just a year ago, so it's been growing quite nicely, and it's just 0.6% of our user base paying right now. But I think in the coming years, I, I think we can reach 2-3% um, you know, paying, which at scale becomes you know, pretty significant. It's like you know, over $100 million in revenues on only subscription. Uh, but we, we entered f uh, the financial services uh, two years back um, by acquiring a fintech company. And the reason for that for us was because we believe that financial like transactions usually go hand, goes hand in hand with communication. Like if you want to buy something from someone on a classified website, you know, there's communication uh, where TrueColor adds an identity uh, on top of that communication layer. So you know that the person you're speaking to is a trusted person. Um, uh, so we're part of the communication, but, you know, the, the transaction side of it is quite... Uh, yeah, the experience is not good. So we thought we could improve the experience and make the whole thing much, much better and build something similar, like similar user experience that you have in Sweden with Switch, but for emerging markets, basically. Uh, now, you don't make that much money on transactions, but long term, we believe that there are other services that we can connect between small businesses and our consumers. Uh, that we actually can monetize on. Uh, and, and speak about the trust element a little yeah. bit here, because obviously, you know, I mentioned it was already when we met you, it was a bit about trust, right? And it's only grown stronger. Mm. And there's really an identity layer through the mass of users and their relationships with each other and, and knowing who is who. Yeah. So, so I think in most markets, uh, one doesn't even understand the trust factor in Truecaller in India, which is the main market and also the main market for monetization. So, so enlighten us a bit. What, what's, uh, what is that really, really with Truecaller, especially maybe in India? Yeah, I think, um, you know, if we're born and raised in Sweden, as I am, um, you sort of get used to the different services that are available, like, uh, you know, hitta.se, or you can just go in and search for someone by name and you get, you know, their income, what cars they drive, uh, where they live and all. That doesn't exist in most parts of the world. Um, and the reason why we have it in Sweden is because it's a trusted society. We don't suspect someone who calls you to actually fool you, scam you, whatever it is. Uh, 
<laughs> but in most parts of the world, it's actually the total opposite. So true color adds a really strong identity layer on, on communication. So I would say, you know, the, the simple analogy for people in Sweden is bank ID is giving you a sort of an identity on who are you sending money to or who are, who are you when you log into uh, different services. That is the sort of layer that True Color adds to payments, to communication, and now also to other services, like other apps, um, because we have an SDK, so you can actually, developers can implement it, and then you can easily log into other apps using your True Color account. And we sign in around 700,000 people per day on third-party apps. It's everything from, you know, um, <coughs> Uh, service called um, o uh, Oyo, which is like Airbnb, but in India, um, uh, bus ticketing apps or services, a bunch of different uh, apps basically that use our SDK for verification, authentication. Okay. And do remember, True Caller in India is actually, I guess, a verb nowadays. It's in movies and, and places like yeah, that. Yeah, this yeah. one I had to mention, although I want to get to the scaling part. Yeah, I mean, uh, it is a verb, it's it's a household name, and, um, you know, it happens a couple of times per year, like, big Bollywood producers calls us and says, like, hey, there's a line of true color in this movie, pay us money, and we say, no, we don't pay, and they go, okay, we're still going to have it. So it happens, and it's quite fun. I mean, it's there was one big movie that won a bunch of awards last year. Um, uh, I forgot the name of it, but, but they actually played it in Sweden as well. It was the, like the number one movie last year in India. Yeah, so this is kind of to set the scene of the scale of things. And actually, you know, we built a few software businesses, very successful ones ourselves, but we never saw this kind of growth in certain aspects. Mm. So when it comes to users, it's one of the biggest actually in the world. So it's like 1% of 1% of 1% of entrepreneurs might experience this kind of user growth. Then when it comes to revenue growth, you know, you're at significant levels, but a little bit earlier. So it's maybe 1% of 1% of entrepreneurs who will experience that. Organization, you kept it pretty tight. You know, maybe you're the 1% of entrepreneurs who get to 250 50 people, because most businesses, of course, in the world in general, fail or don't scale. But, but regardless of which one we take of those, mm. it's maybe more than what you saw when you started it. Uh, it definitely surprises you and it's always something new that you need to learn and so on. How do you maybe mentally and in general prepare for that? Yeah, I mean, uh, so me and Ami, we used to have this thing in the early days that we should always know the name of all the employees. And that's easy when you're 100 people, but you know, once it grows and it grows outside of Stockholm, it becomes much, much harder. But I, I, you know, every time I fly to India, I have all the names printed out with pictures, so I just remind myself. I think it's important. Um, but how do you sort of uh, set yourself to you know, know how to lead an organization like that? I don't know, honestly. Uh, we have s you know, good people in management that we have hired and learned a lot from during the years. But in some way, I don't think, you know, I'm, I'm very on the opposite side of, hey, we need to wake up at four every morning, do yoga and, you know, all that training shit, um, and be at the office at three uh, in the morning. You wake up four, but you're still in the office at three. But that sort of thing, I don't believe in that. I believe in, you know, sleep eight hours, um, follow the flow in some way, and, and learn, uh, try to understand people and, you know, learn from them, basically. Um, I think when we try to overcomplicate things by reading books and all that, I don't think, you know, there's no, like, recipe for success. You just have to sort of adapt to, to the situation. Um, but, and most people talk about transparency in organizations, but I think most people don't know what trust and transparency in an organization actually means. Um, but for us, it basically means all the numbers should always be available for everyone. Every week we have all hands for the whole organization. Every business unit um, gets to present, uh, you know, once a month, how is my team doing? How are we doing on goals? We also talk about, you know, exactly how much money we make on a weekly basis. Did we do well? Did we do bad? Is growth going good is, or not? Um, because it's easy to talk about the good things. Uh, and when you try to censor the bad things, then you won't be, able to rally everyone around you when 
when you actually need them. So um, I don't know. I mean, I think we've just tried to do what we think is common practice in some way. Um, but at some point, honestly, like now when we're so big, uh, at least in India and so forth, I think my job when I go there is just to be visible, say hi to everyone and, you know, hold a speech, kiss some babies and then fly home more or less. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah. I just wish that someday I'll get to the level where me kissing babies is, is big news, <laughs> you know. No, but, but when it comes to great entrepreneurs, I mean, typically we, we like to see people who are really good at something. Maybe the domain or maybe they're just amazing salespeople or amazing technologists or whatever. But maybe the even more important characteristics, which is really hard to measure, is learning agility. Because in a startup, when it grows, you need to learn so many things. And then obviously you need to learn, like you mentioned here, to actually delegate and change your own role a lot. You're doing very different things now than you did, did uh, 12 years ago. But let me still ask uh, 12 years ago. It's not that long. 11 2000, this year. 2012, 11 years ago when you started. Um, when we met each other, what were you really good at back then? Obviously, you've been great at learning because you're a very different CEO today. Well, I think I was a pretty decent coder. Uh, I mean, uh, me and my co-founder, we built the back-end infrastructure. So I think we were decent coders, not good. It depends if you ask our engineers, because they cleaned up everything during the years. But I think what we were good at uh, was problem solving, like seeing the challenges, seeing like growth patterns, try to push the right buttons. Uh, I think we were horrible managers back then. I mean, I remember having this conversation with our first HR manager because, uh, you know, she came in and said, you know, we were 15 people. She, she said, we need an org chart and we need people reporting to different people. And I said, I don't believe in that. I think it's bullshit. She said, well, I don't care what you think. We need to have it. And, you know, now in hindsight, it just sounds stupid that I even thought that way uh, because we had to sort of set up for a more scalable structure. And, and by the way, I mean, normally it's investors on the board who are like, you need this and you need that. And I'm sure we had some of that as well. But actually in this particular example, yeah. I recall it was actually the other way around. And we've learned something from you because you guys were like, you know, we need this HR person. And I thought that it's way too early for that. Your, your, business, your organization is not that big. You don't need it. But you actually knew that you were not that great at it. Yeah. and that you needed to scale fast. So, so now I've learned to look at companies, you know, do they need it earlier or later, depending on what founders are really focusing on. Yeah, that's probably true. I mean, you need to do what you think is fun in some way. I mean, today, I know what I like to do and I know what I don't like to do. And usually the stuff I don't like to do, I, I do them bad because I, I don't want to do them. Uh, so I just leave it to people who are actually passionate about it. Uh, and... Uh, and it's easy to fall in the trap as an entrepreneur uh, or a founder to want to be involved in everything. And that is something hard to learn. Like, you cannot be involved in everything. You need to just forget about it. Let someone do it. Like, now we just moved to a new big office, beautiful office. And, I, uh, you know, they came, everyone came to me. What do you, what color do you want on this one? Or what do you want? I said, look, don't ask me. I, I'm sure it will be fine. For Steve Jobs, that was important, by the way. <laughs> yeah, that's what they say. That's what they say. So... Problem solving, constant problem solving, learning like crazy, unprecedented things. What has been the hardest in the last five to ten years? I think the, the emotionally the hardest thing we did was end of 2015 when we had to lay off a couple of people. Uh, that, was, that was the hardest one. Just, you know, telling the whole organization that some of you will have to, you know, leave. Uh, you know, just looking people in the eye and you see in their face that something is wrong. Uh, that was that was really, really hard, just keeping, you know, all the emotions inside, even, you know, keeping yourself uh, from uh, crying, basically. Uh, had had the same experience back in the days. So yeah. It was really hard not to cry. But, you know, we, we did the, the most common mistakes in a company. You raise a lot of money. Uh, you scale too fast, you add a lot of people to the organization, you forget to add good leaders to the or organization, so it just becomes chaotic in some way. And then market turns and you realize, okay, we have lots of uh, costs, um, 
and we have X amount of money in the bank, at, and if we cannot raise money, then we need to start thinking about that right now. Uh, so we went through that journey, which was uh, tough, but it was also one of the best moments in, in our history because that was the moment we also said, okay, it's time to start thinking about revenues. How do we become a sustainable and long-term company? Um, and, uh, and that is the challenge in venture-backed companies because in some way you need to show growth and you're supposed to not show revenues because your valuation is based on how much revenues you can make in the future. But if you start to make revenues because you need to, then in some way you have proven that you are not making the amount of money that the market is expecting. But at some point you just need to understand that it's, you know, it's about uh, the survival of the company and you know, it's, it's a long-term bet. And of course companies grow in very, very different ways. I mean UiPath, which we almost invested in, sadly didn't. You know, they grew not profitably from about a million to 300 million in ARR in four years, used shitloads of money to do that. This company has never burned a lot of money, but has still burned some money. Now I guess it's okay to say that you're profitable. We have right. another one which we luckily did invest in, Supermetrics in Finland, which has the last three years grown 2.5x revenue every year while doing 35 to 40 percent profit, they're now at 20 million in revenue. So at the early stages, because they have an inherently super efficient business model. So companies can grow fast and in attractive ways very, very differently. Yeah. We talked about what's hard. You may throw in some more of that. Is, has there been anything that's been surprisingly easy? Um, that's a good question. Come on, something. And I will say in between, while he's pondering, from a side, with the viral, natural, user-based growth, adoption of the Truecaller app, uh, it looks like that has been easy. But I must say that the years that I was on the board, I was always kind of surprised, although I worked with tech companies all my life, how much of the focus was still on the product and honing it and delivering new stuff and never having enough resources to deliver what you really want to deliver and what customers are asking for. So that part has definitely not been easy, but it looks easy from the outside. Yeah, I mean, it, it always does. Um, I don't know what has been easy, but I think in general, most things has felt pretty straightforward. Uh, now in hindsight, it's easy to say that, of course. Uh, but, I mean, you guys came on board when I was like 25 years old or something. So we were young and naive, which was great because then you just do stuff. You, you still are maybe not as naive. Well, I think I'm still uh, a bit naive, but I have matured a bit. Um, but what, what has been easy has probably been like product decisions that we've taken because we've always been quite involved in the details on product, uh, which some people like and some people don't like. Um, but you know, taking quick decision on stuff has never felt hard, um, and you know I think it's important. But uh, of course, we take wrong decisions uh, very often as well. But it's better to take wrong decisions than not taking any decisions a at all. Um, but at some point, it was quite easy for us to raise money. We had a really, really good momentum. We turned down a bunch of investors, but that can also swing. I mean, you can become you know the celebrity, and then you can become the trash, and no one wants to touch as well. You just have to be humble. But luckily now, I mean, it's a long journey. Now you're in a good place. Growth is good. Market position is good. Revenues are good. There's even profitability. So raising funding is not difficult. It's more about what's the optimal solution for, for what, what moment. But with that as a kind of status point, what next? What's happening the next couple of years? And some people rumor about an IPO. And can you talk about uh, that? Yeah, absolutely. No, we went out with uh, the news the other day. So we're planning to make an IPO or be IPO ready 2022. And um, fortunately, it's not because we have pressure from our investors. Like all our investors are super long term, which I'm happy about. Um, especially Sequoia, who's our biggest shareholder. But they've been with us for now seven years and they're super long term. Uh, but the main reason was actually me and my co-founder, Nami, we actually told the board that we want to make an IPO within three years. And they said, why? And we said, because 15% of the company is owned by our, our employees, excluding myself and, and Nami. And at some point, we want their shares to be liquid. And, you know, so they can take, you know, some, some off 
the table basically or feel that you know um, I think for most people they don't really understand what you know the value of shares uh, till it becomes liquid but also it becomes easier to hire people uh, especially in a market like Stockholm when you have Spotify or and other companies who are public they can just give shares and after a year they can sell them so there's a lot of pros as well and then also, I think it's it's going to be an interesting journey, you know, go through that. Uh, Another phase. point of learning. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, we need to we need to you know mature a bit more um, on our predictability in terms of revenues. I think you know the the two main revenue streams we have today is fairly predictable, uh, but while we're developing more and more on fintech, we need to learn. Can you speak about that? What's coming up on the financial services side, yeah, payment so side? So we're actually launching our lending product uh, this month. It's, a, it's already out our beta uses. Uh, and what we're trying to do is to help people in emerging markets, the um, underserved people basically, who can't get a loan from the bank and uh, give them a credit line through our partners using alternative data that we have about our customers. Because in these markets, there are no digital transaction history. Uh, so there's no way to determine whether this person is uh, you know, can pay back the loan, basically. And for the bank, the efforts they put in on an individual is the same whether, you know, it's uh, someone who wants uh, 500 crowns or 500,000 crowns. Uh, so they rather not uh, take those customers on board. And we launched our pay product last year. We have around 20 million people using TrueCaller for payment services and connected their bank accounts. So, um, you know, I think there's a huge potential to help these people and get online basically in the credit world, especially the small businesses. Um, there are a lot of small businesses, around 80 million in India. How do we help them to accelerate their business? Um, Is there something in TrueCaller that makes you better at, with initially at least partners, give out, give out money? Because it's really easy to give out money, to give out money that is being paid back and maybe even with lower default rates than in some other contexts, yeah. especially in these longer tales of consumers, mm -hmm. is is really hard. So, so why why will you be good at this? Well, th three things. Uh, I think if you if you're going to be successful within lending, uh, you need to have a really good uh, credit uh, scoring model, basically, um, and you need to have data. And we check that box. Second, you need to have a huge reach to t take down acquisition cost, uh, which is usually what takes down your profits or your margins. And since we already have 150 million people on our product already, acquisition will be free for us. Daily, right? Sorry? 150 million daily on your product. Uh, not daily in India. Uh, it's 110 million uh, daily on in India. Globally. Uh, 165 is daily uh, in, uh, globally, but uh, so you know. And the, the third one I is basically, uh, you know, in some way, getting people to pay back, uh, and that's where I think we can get help from partners and so forth. At the beginning, we're not going to use uh, land from our own balance sheet, but we have a couple of partners that we have, uh, uh, you know, signed agreements with. And for us, it was important to take on players that we know are serious in this business and because we are as big as we are we can actually decide who we want to take on board because the, the problem in these markets is if you take the wrong partner on board and they start lending out money the moment people don't pay back they will actually send you the mob and the mob will knock on your door they will knock on your parents door etc and that's not what we want to stand for so pretty exciting times ago I certainly, as an early investor, hope there will be an IPO because also us eventually want to want to take the big profits out of it. Uh, payments, obviously, an even larger market space when it comes to and and financial services when it comes to potentially monetizing. So that's very very exciting. More growth coming, more learnings coming. But we have two three minutes for one or two questions uh, for the audience. Seventy percent of our base, yeah. We're quite big in Africa, in um, Nigeria, Kenya, South Africa, Ghana, a bunch of uh, countries there. Um, I would say, on average, we probably have fifty to eighty percent market share in terms of smartphone penetration. 
the, the challenges like um, in Nigeria with a population of 200 plus million people, there are only 20 million smartphones, connected smartphones. And if we have 10, 15 million of those, it doesn't change the absolute number for us. Um, but we're expecting a lot of growth coming from these markets in the coming years because you know smartphone penetration and adoption is increasing. Uh, we're seeing good growth right now in Latin America, uh, new growth for us, uh, Indonesia, uh, Malaysia. So, um, you know, in three years, we're expecting to be somewhere around four or 500 million active users, uh, whereof India will probably stand for 300 of those.